Hello and welcome to our webcast, Sustainable Consumption in Asia, Do Consumers Actually Care? Before we get started, uh, I would like to uh, give you a few um, guidance on how to interact with us because we, we hope that we have an engaged discussion and uh, you can ask questions at any point in time during this webcast and we will try uh, to answer them uh, in, in the flow of the conversation. Um, the questions you type in in the uh, little box, chat box at the bottom left hand of your screen. And please make use of that at any point. Uh, the presentation you will see today, uh, you can download uh, in the middle box. And, um, and if at any point in time during this uh, webcast you would like to look at a, a screen in full screen, on the top right, you see th uh, four arrows. Uh, if you click on them, uh, the uh, picture will move into full screen. And uh, if you click on them again, you're back in, into this layout. Um, you will be able to share this uh, webcast with your colleagues because this is, session is being recorded. And um, probably tomorrow or latest uh, uh, early next week, this will be available for uh, download and uh, streaming. I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing to you today our uh, uh, my partner in discussion, uh, Anke Schrader. Um, and uh, Anke leads the research in the conference board, uh, China Center, and also the broader Asia region. Her personal hi, research. Hi, hi, Anke. Um, and um, her personal research focus is on corporate citizenship and sustainability. She has worked in China over 15 years and is the author of many publications uh, in social and environmental agenda and, uh, and its uh, impact on company practices. So a very warm welcome to you. And um, uh, before we get uh, started, I would like to introduce the Global Sustainability Center to, to our audience uh, as uh, this is a, a featured webcast from the Sustainability Center. In the center, we are uh, blessed to have uh, researchers in the US, in Europe, and uh, in Asia. Uh, Anke and Minji Shi are uh, the two representatives in Asia. And we're trying to support member companies to create long-term value and positive impact through the integration of sustainability into business strategy and operations. We're guided through the UN SDGs, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, and responsible standards and frameworks uh, like the UN Global Compact. We thrive to be fact-based and independent. And in our endeavor, we are uh, supervised and helped by uh, advisory board uh, with senior man managers from Europe, the US, and Asia. We provide online training courses. Uh, we have podcasts and webcasts, and we publish reports. And uh, if you want to get in touch with us, feel free to contact me at any point in time. Uh, and uh, you can also email sustainability at tcb.org. Uh, Anke, uh, sorry, I'm a bit confused here, uh, pressing the wrong button. Uh, Anke, um, we want to discuss the relevance of the global trend of consumers' increased care about sustainability. And uh, you and I will discuss the, the emergence of the Asian middle class and, it, and that opportunity that emerges from that for, um, for businesses to engage in sustainable consumption. Can you, before we get really into uh, uh, the, the research, can you give us a little bit of guidance on what is actually the concept of sustainable consumption? Thank you, Uwe, and welcome everybody. So before we launch into the actual discussion on the research findings, I would like us all to get on the same page as to what we actually mean when we talk about sustainable consumption. So at a very basic level, in the context of our work, con sustainable consumption is the consumption of goods and services that firstly have a minimal impact on the environment, 
are as much as possible socially equitable and are economically viable. And then on an aggregate level are within the world's resource limits. So this is at a very fundamental level how we see, how we define sustainable consumption. Then if we dig a little bit deeper, if we first look at the individual level, so this is how people on a personal, um, from a personal point of view, usually think about sustainable consumption. So in most people's minds, sustainable consumption is about firstly consume less overall, so consuming less products and services, but also when they purchase products to make more environmentally and or ethically conscious spending choices. Now, if we look, if we go from the individual level to the more aggregate level, sustainable consumption is overall about more equitable consumption. So that means that people who are currently at the bottom of the consumption period, so people who are actually consuming very little, so that those people can actually move up the consumption ladder and, and can increase their consumption. But all the way, all, all the while at an aggregate level, we are staying within the Earth's resource limits. Yeah, so it's about being more equitable in terms of an aggregate consumption level. Now, if we translate both of these levels, really sustainable consumption is about consuming differently. It's about curbing consumerism, but it is also about shifting demand towards products and services that have reduced resource inputs and waste and are socially more equitable. Um, we... In the context of Asia, there are a number of things at play that influence consumption patterns. Obviously, um, you know, two are very important. One is population growth overall. So we have um, several countries within Asia, emerging Asian countries, that um, still <clears throat> are growing quite rapidly, adding more and more people to their to their aggregate populations. And then we have a second trend um, that is related to changes in income levels. So more and more people moving from lower income levels into a broader middle income spectrum. However well that is defined, you know, there's, there's a lot of debate around uh, what is considered middle income level, um, what is considered a middle, um, a middle income uh, class. But um, overall, if we, if we are thinking about a broad range of people that are within um, an income bracket that allows them to spend some of their discretionary um, income on, <clears throat> um, on consumer products, um, that segment is, is growing very, very rapidly in Asia. Obviously, COVID um, has thrown us off. Um, it's at this point in time, I think, impossible to predict um, how this is going to play out over the next uh, um, you know, few years. But looking at historical trends as, as kind of a sort of a baseline scenario for us here in this discussion, um, we can see that when we look at um, changes in, um, in uh, middle class populations um, glo globally, then you can see that compared 2018 and 2030, um, we can see here that the middle class is the one segment that is going to grow the quickest over the next decade. This obviously has huge implications in Asia. Um, the vast majority of that growth is going to happen in Asia, specifically in India and China. So nine out of 10 people who are moving into the global middle class over the next um, decade or so will be residing in Asia. On top of that, the middle income households really are the ones that account for the largest share of global consumption. And they're also the fastest growing consumer segment overall. Um, so when we think about this shift in terms of income levels and then associated consumer spending, what is really going to happen in Asia is a shift in spending behavior from consumption um, that is driven by need. So satisfying you know, basic needs around food items, about you know, other, other aspects of life um, to a consumption pattern that is driven by choice. Now, um, I know there's always a lot of debate around 
are we actually moving into a more um, you know sustainable consumption era? Um, what are consumers really thinking about um, this topic? What does their behavior look like? Um, there is obviously you know there's a lot of research in this space. There's not a lot of um, consolidated data or comparable data that would make it very easy to identify a clear trend. But there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that can help us understand where um, where we're going a little bit in this regard. So you know, for one, for example, we can look at consumer expectations. A lot of that research is done through survey work. So we're asking consumers um, about their expectations, um, their behaviors when it comes to uh, consumption patterns. Um, these numbers are based on work that we've done together with Nielsen. Um, there's a very, very clear preference now globally that companies should help to improve the environment. So this is one, this is um, um, a question that is part of one of the surveys we're running globally. And the vast majority of consumers are in agreement that companies need to be part of the solution to solving our environmental problems in this world. Um, when we look at emerging Asia, and emerging markets and emerging Asia in particular, um, there's almost universal agreement. You know, there's almost almost everybody in those regions think that companies need to be part of that solution. Um, we can also look at shifts um, in market share. So, um, you know, when we look at certain markets like the U.S., we see that um, when we study certain segments like fast-moving consumer goods we see that there's very, very high growth compared to conventional products. So for example, in this, in this specific uh, instance, this was a study also done by Nielsen and um, it, grouped sustain it grouped fast moving consumer goods in sustainable versus conventional products. And the sustainable products had a four times higher um, compounded annual growth rates over the conventional products. Um, a third category by which we can measure engagement around sustainable consumption is product segment strategies of companies. And this is probably one of the most solid ways of, of, of looking at this because the sales data of companies is usually very closely monitored and the data is very accurate. So when we look at, for example, um, companies like Unilever, and they're sustainable living brands. So these are brands that have a specific focus around environmental and social issues. Then we can see that these, um, these segments of, of Unilever's business are growing a lot faster than the rest of the business. To the research you have been doing and um, about sustainable consumption in Asia, and I would like you to share a little bit uh, with us how this was done and what conclusions um, we can draw from that. So yeah, so Uwe was asking me about the study that we did on sustainable consumption in Asia. Um, and so I wanted to give you just a, a, a quick background on this. Um, the conference board is doing um, a global consumer confidence survey every quarter. We're doing this in collaboration with Nielsen. And um, so this is a very, very uh, large scale survey. We are serving um, over 30,000 consumers in 64 markets worldwide, including 14 Asian markets. And, and every quarter we are adding um, additional questions um, that you know, are sort of on top of the, the baseline questions. And um, last year we added a, um, a set of questions around sustainability, um, consum sustainable consumption patterns. Um, and so we were able to then do a global comparison of attitudes, uh, preferences and behaviors around sustainable consumption. And I'm going to, what I want to do is I want to share with you some of the findings, some of the interesting findings um, within the Asia region, but also comparing Asia with Europe and, um, and North America, um, because there are also some very interesting differences between the regions, not only within the region. Um, so one of the um, key findings really of the study was that consumers do not really have a strong association with one aspect of sustainability across different countries. And this is very important, obviously, for companies that are trying to launch products that have certain attributes, um, that have a certain messaging um, across a variety of different markets. Um, let me explain to you what I mean with this. Um, so what we asked um, consumers is um, they should um, 
tell us what they associate with sustainable products. And in this first chart here, um, you can see we asked a variety of different answer options around environmental protection, recycling, energy, climate change. We have pollution, fair price, fair labor, um, charity and community development, and, um, and GMO. And so if we just take um, the, the first kind of segment and looking more at the environmental aspect of it, you can already see that across the different markets within Asia, there's huge variation in terms of the association with these different topics. So we have, you know, overall, I think um, um, we have a fairly high association around environmental protection. But at the same time, then when we look at uh, when we look at related subjects, for example, around pollution, there are countries where there's very low association and there are countries with very high association. If you take, for example, in, in this context of pollution, you take Japan as an example and you take Thailand. So there's a, a very wide uh, variety of responses across markets, not a lot of consensus around um, association with sustainable products. Um, we can see a similar trend if we pick out just energy and climate change. So the brighter green here is energy and, and um, sort of the, the darker green is, is climate change. And again, you can see that um, the variability is, 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 is quite large across, across the different markets. Um, fair price, um, again, a lot of fluctuation. Um, fair price is one is, is has a fairly strong association if we look at, at the aggregate um, across Asia Pacific. But then again, we see markets where this is very really the top association, like in Malaysia, where where we have 60% of people saying, you know, when I think of a sustainable product, I think about fair prices versus other markets where that association um, is much, much lower. Anke, may I just interrupt you uh, briefly? Yes. Fair price. Can you just explain uh, the concept? Of, not everybody might might be familiar with, with that. Of course, no problem. Um, so in the context of Asia, fair price uh, actually stands um, for um, the sense that a product is, is priced uh, in a way that um, is is, is uh, fair in, uh, in terms of quality and price relationship. Um, it's actually quite interesting because that association or that concept of fair price is very different in Asia versus in, in, in the Western markets where fair price is much more associated with the concept of fair trade and you know, paying fair prices to the producers who are producing the product rather than I pay a fair price for the product. Versus in, in, in Asia, that association is much more around how much money do I pay for for the product, and is that in line with um, with the quality and with the production costs of, of that product? Um, fair labor, um, yes, um, it's, it's another very interesting one. Um, it's not as high as we might suspect. Um, we would think that in the Asian context, um, we would see higher rankings. It's, it's relatively low associated. And again, there's um, some wide variability here. And then we have some other factors here that, that don't really play a, a very large role. So, you know, charity, community development, um, these types of issues aren't really associated um, with sustainable products by consumers. So if we are, you know, thinking this through in terms of a branding strategy and we're trying to make those linkages between a product and, and, and this type of um, um, association or issue that we want to highlight um, um, for the product, this is going to be a much harder sell because there's just not, in the consumer's mind, that connection just isn't very strong. Yeah, thank you. Th thank you so much. But we, we have a, a, a question which... In, intersects a little bit with what we're talking, but I think we should answer it now. Um, Michael uh, asks the question, would uh, research support that consumer expectation with respect to the government uh, should help to improve the environment? Yeah, so the relationship, uh, corporations, government. Do we have something on that? If we have research on that? Yeah. Um, Part of the part of this um, study actually also looked at um, the expectations that consumers have in terms of 
um, what government should do and what other types of institutions like public organizations should do. We're not covering it here in this webcast, um, but we do have research on it. Um, it's covered in our global report um, and, and there is a strong association there. Um, so consumers do have um, the expectation that governments need to um, ha you know, create um, an enabling environment so that companies can you know, follow through with strategies. So there is, there is that expectation. Um, there's also an expectation that um, national level organizations or even um, um, you know, multilateral organizations um, should have a strong position or should have, you know, take a lead in, in, in trying to manage um, this in the right direction. Um, I'm happy to, either you can get in touch with me directly, Michael, or, um, or we can share it maybe through some other means. Um, we can share the global study and, and we're talking about that in a little bit more detail in, in that report using this data actually. Yeah, we. Uh, I, I will. Uh, in, in a second, I will uh, share the, the the link to to the report um, in the chat box. Ah, perfect. Um, Thank you, Uwe. Uh, but before I do that, um, looking at the slide we're uh, we're seeing at the moment, um, you, you know, it doesn't look like that across Asia we have a common denominator here on what people associate with sustainable products. Um, That's right. Is is there is there maybe a, a connection with with brands, Anke, uh, rather than just products? Yeah, there's definitely a stronger connection when it comes to the question of. Um, there's definitely um, a very a much stronger connection when it comes to um, asking consumers what sustainability factors are influencing their brand choices. Um, so when we look at that. Then we see some more. Then we see some clearer patterns. So let me just share this data with you here. Um, let's start out with the regional comparison. And here you can see I've I've marked here um, our Europe aggregate, I marked our North America aggregate, and I marked the Asia Pacific aggregate. And you can see here that you know there is a fairly strong association around environmental friendly uh, production here when it comes to kind of you know um, brand choices. Um, that are influenced by sustainability factors. And we also see for Asia a, a fairly large association um, around inter like, you know, adhering to intellectual property rights, um, much larger so than in the Western markets. Um, what we interestingly don't see is a strong association around um, or strong, strong influence around um, social practices. So when we're talking, for example, about um, um, fair labor conditions, um, no child labor um, or equal pay measures. So these are much less uh, pronounced in Asia, much less pronounced in Asia than in the Western markets. Now, if we are looking across the board here, across um, you know the different Asian markets, you can see that there's there, there is some variety here. There's there are markets like China, for example, where IP rights play a very very strong role, um, and you know on the other hand in China. Some, you know, certain practices, for example, around the social practices or around like issues like child labor, they virtually don't play a role at all. Versus, obviously, you know, in other markets, um, particular in the ones that um, are, are more advanced, like Australia, for example, that's a huge issue. That is that that is the most important issue, or right after uh, environmental um, um, environmental friendly production, that is the biggest issue. So there are. You know, again, there are a lot of discrepancies here. Not only are there differences regionally, so that you know the Asian, um, the Asian um, is sort of you know consumers here are influenced by very different um, um, attributes of sustainability, but also when they make brand choices. But also across the board within the markets, there is interestingly what we also see when we just think about brands that have better environmental practices. So, um, you know, when we ask consumers, okay, what are, you know, what keeps you from buying a product that you think has, you know, better environmental performance or, you know, the, um, the, <clears throat> the company that's producing the product is having better environmental practices maybe as, you know, um, the company that, a competitive company that's producing a similar product. So when we look at these, at these barriers, um, we, we see that actually price obviously does 
play a role. I think that's that's very, that's obvious. I mean, any study that we look at will tell us that um, that price considerations are always uh, one of the key factors. But actually, when we look at Asia, price plays um, much less of a role than it does in, for example, in in Europe or or in North America. So you can see that here at, at the bottom in the in the green shade green shaded areas that price actually is significantly less relevant across Asia than it is um, in the West. What is more important is, for example, considerations around. I said earlier that when it comes to um, you know kind of brand behavior or you know what types of what kind of uh, um, um, things people look at when they when they when they make purchasing decisions, I said that. Um, um, you know, kind of social issues and, and labor issues aren't aren't as strongly associated as you as you may think. Um, and so we, um, you know, another question that we ask people around barriers to buying sustainable brands is like, what about brands that um, or products that have um, um, that claim to have fair labor conditions or you know are paying fair wages? What 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 are kind of the barriers that keep you from buying brands um, like that? And um, what we see here, and this is kind of sort of a, a global, overwhelmingly global trend, is that um, it isn't really the, the extra price that's keeping people from, if there is an extra price, so to speak, you know, um, which isn't a given, obviously. But if there is a price premium, that's not, not the primary reason why people don't buy. The primary reason really is lack of information, is that people simply don't know um, which brands are more fair. And so this information lag is really a, a crucial barrier to overcome, and we see that um, across the board globally. That's one of the key um, key things that we observed in this study um, um, across all markets that we looked at. But um, yes, sometimes very significantly so in in Asia is that um, there seems to be um, a lack of information, a lack of clear guidance um, around. Um, what makes this company or um, more fair? What 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 does it mean to have fair labor conditions? Um, what does it mean to have uh, fair wages? Um, um, and and obviously, um, I would assume a certain level of of distrust around around those claims. I have another question, um, and uh, from Mel Rice. Uh, I think it could perhaps be val valuable to see Asian country comparison uh, of their association with sustainable. Uh, products if it was presented in terms of population size and or GDP uh, because there are significant differences across the region. Right. Yeah. In the, you know, in the, um, in the regional analysis, we are, you know, we are um, accounting for, um, for country size. But obviously then if you look at the individual country, that sort of becomes irrelevant because because um, then you just look at that single market. So in that instance, obviously, it's much easier to make a direct comparison. But um, yeah, I agree when you do the regional ones. It's, so the aggregate ones are taking into account different sizes of different markets. That's why you also see um, if you sort of look across the countries and then you look at the, at the Asia regional um, aggregate, you can see that the aggregate is um, skewed towards um, the markets with the larger population. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm glad we, we talked to each other again. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, there is another area which um, we, we, we've seen in, in, in Europe, but mainly also in the US, that brands are starting to take a social stance. Um, what do Asian consumers think about that? Yeah, so we we did ask that question. I mean, when we when we feel that that survey did little, did we know we had no you know we had no idea that um, um, what would happen uh, this year and to you know with what force this topic would come to the surface, especially in the U.S. But we did ask um, when we fielded the survey last year. We talked about um, brands that claim to have strong positions on social causes um, or on social issues, and um, we asked consumers again about the barriers of, of, of buying those brands. Um, and here what we see is, is quite interesting, um, especially for Asia, is that um, consumers have a, obviously a variety of reasons of why they are hesitant to, to buy brands that, that have kind of take a strong stand on social causes. But what is very interesting to see is that uh, a fair share of consumers in Asia say 
they, they don't want to be appear to be endorsing a brand social position. And actually that sentiment is much stronger in Asia than it is in, 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 in other regions of the world. Um, a fair share of them says, I don't believe brands should be taking any social position, period. You know? um, and um, people think that they may disagree with the social positions that brands have. And if you take these three together, these kind of very, um, you know, very strongly negative associations, those are the three that are probably most strongly negative, uh, you know, you're already at over 50% of, um, um, of the consumer market. So from, you know, from, <clears throat> It makes it very, very tricky to position yourself, uh, you know, uh, around social causes um, with that much uncertainty about the reaction of the consumers, which I think is one of the key challenges um, for companies when when they take this issue on. And again, if we look across the board, um, we're seeing some variation. Obviously, you know, we are seeing some. If, for example, interestingly, again, you know, or maybe not surprisingly, probably, but if we look at China here. Um, those three um, areas that I just outlined, you know, not wanting to endorse a certain position, disagreeing with it, um, or, or saying brands shouldn't be taking any kind of position, is, you know, here is is already at at you know basically almost 60% of of um, um, of the consumers that we that we polled, and so it's 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 very um, a balancing act to overcome and to anticipate which way it will go, um, especially because it's such an individual um, issue for consumer that's very hard to predict. And we should bear in mind, Anke, that this was done um, last year before COVID-19, yes. the research. And, yes. and I think we've seen that social causes have suddenly uh, emerged stronger. And I think it will be uh, very interesting to see the, the, the changes once we have new new data. Yeah, absolutely. But I also think that it, it will be very interesting to again, and this kind of goes back to these findings is, is um, um, you know, the breadth of opinions obviously will be very, very wide. Yes, it has come to the fore um, a lot stronger. And, and, and I think consumers are, um, they maybe if we would run the survey now, people would have a much stronger opinion that companies should be taking a stand or that they would be, you know, that um, but on the other hand, what that stand should be, right? What that opinion should be, what, um, and which social cause should be supported, um, that will be very hard to predict. So that's kind of that's the challenge. I agree, um, Anke. The um, this this is related to the question of um, as a consumer, do I put my money where my mouth is? So do I switch brands uh, for a certain reason or not? Uh, have have you looked at that? Yeah, we we've we've looked at that. Um, so we've looked at um, we've asked people what um, if they have um, switched brands because either they had a positive association with the brand or um, I mean with the with the new brand, right? Um, they felt attracted by a certain attribute of that brand, or they have switched brands because um, they felt like um, that they were turned off by um, some kind of a attribute that the brand that they're currently using has, right? So either um, some kind of a, a positive association with a new brand and that makes them switch or a negative association with the current brand that they're using and it makes them switch. So these were the questions that we that we ask. And it's, um, um, it's very interesting um, to look at the results. So here on the left-hand side, you can see um, the two questions that we polled around um, the answers that were given about Consumers that have um, switched brands because they felt attracted by environmental practices of that new brand, right? Or because they felt attracted by certain social causes of, of that new brand. And you can see that um, um, the um, kind of the spread of the responses across the countries is very, very wide. So on the, on the, on the, on the left, we have Thailand here and Vietnam. Um, and Indonesia, where almost everybody has at some point um, switched brands because um, they felt another another brand has um, um, a better uh, you know better environmental practices or um, are, are you know is supporting a social cost that they that they feel like should be supported right. Versus on the other end of the spectrum, um, we have countries where less than half of consumers um, have reported that they have done so. Now, if we look at negative associations, um, we see a, a similar pattern, but we also see 
that overall um, negative association is somewhat lower, which means that um, you know consumers feel more compelled to switch brands because of something positive that the other brand has, rather than you know um, um, stop purchasing the brand that they are currently purchasing because of some negative um, association that they have with the brand. Now. If we make a regional comparison, it's also again very interesting to see here on the right hand side, I've, I've, I've sort of plotted the, the different regions that we looked at. And you can see that across the board for Asia, um, no matter if it's a, if, if you know, if they feel attracted by, by something new or if they feel turned off by something that they currently have, um, both of these are higher than in any, in any other region. So, you know, cons in conclusion, basically, consumers in Asia are more likely to switch a brand because of something positive that another brand is doing. And they're also more likely to switch the brand because of something negative that, that, that the brand that they're currently using, um, um, some kind of attribute that this brand has. Um, so it, so <clears throat> this can be a good thing, obviously. <laughs> it can also be a bad thing. Um, but anyway, so switching behavior is much more frequent and much more common in Asia than it is in Western market. Yeah, that's um, um, that's something really to bear in mind when you when you communicate. And uh, um, uh, I th I think uh, Anke, it, it would be worth our while you you before we enter the full discussion. Um, uh, you you scoped out a quite a few different aspects. Uh, maybe it's worth our while to summarize um, uh, what what you conclude uh, from your findings. Yeah, yeah. I, I've I've done that here on the on the next slide. I've sort of um, outlined our key takeaways from all this. Um, so when we started out the discussion, we were talking about how consumers define a sustainable product, right? This was one of the very first basic questions that we that we asked. Well, what do you think is a sustainable product, right? And what do you think? What what kind of you know issues come to mind when you think about a sustainable product? And we we found that there's really not a common definition of a sustainable uh, sustainable product across the region. So every country has very different focuses, has has different associations, um, and so it's gonna it's gonna take a very differentiated type of approach and strategy um, to to make that work in the local markets. Um, secondly, we found that. When it comes to choosing brands, um, eco-friendliness definitely, you know, and, and all the kind of things that are associated with eco-friendliness as a broad topic, does resonate most broadly with 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 consumers. Um, but it's also um, it also has the highest price sensitivity. So when you when you remember the stacked bar charts that we had and kind of what are the barriers that keeps you from purchasing um, um, a more sustainable product, um, when it came to um, products that have um, where brands have um, good environmental performance, that price sensitivity was was most apparent. It wasn't as apparent um, for the other categories. Um, a, a very important finding, I think, in the context of Asia, especially in terms of um, you know, um, in context of Asia still being um, you know the manufacturing hub of the world, and a lot of um, relatively basic um, uh, manufacturing is going on in this region. Um, consumers here don't really associate a sustainable product with fair labor practices. Um, so if this is kind of the selling point of, of a brand, um, it's going to take some strategizing uh, to, to kind of edge that out and why that is important and convey that in the right way to, to consumers, because that's not top of mind when people think about sustainability and it, from a consumer point of view. Um, social causes, um, we talked about this just now a little bit. Um, it's very interesting. It can go either way. Um, there's obviously um, there are a lot of reservations around social causes in, in, in the region, in some countries very strongly so, that people feel like um, companies should not be associating themselves with social causes for a variety of reasons. Um, but we've also seen that, you know, and this was the last chart, chart that I showed earlier when we talked about switching brands, we have seen that um, in some markets, a very high share of consumers have said that they have switched brands because they felt attracted by the social cause that another brand is supporting. So if you've got it right, then there's obviously you know a, um, a good opportunity to attract a new uh, type of consumer segment through that. But it's obviously it's a very tightrope walk. It can it, you know it, it can be. A, I think it's one of the more challenging um, areas to 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 get into. Um, and then finally, um, overall, consumers in Asia 
are just more easily swayed either way, right? So they are more easily swayed to leave a brand and go to a new one that they perceive as being um, better from an environmental or social viewpoint. Um, and um, um, they're also um, more easily, they're also more likely to drop a brand that they're currently using because they're not satisfied with um, the sustainability performance of, of that brand. And again, you know, if, 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 if you're a brand that is excelling at that, that can be a huge opportunity because obviously brand loyalty is not as high. But it also it creates huge challenges because if you don't get it right, you will see, you know, potentially see a, a larger share of consumers jump ship more quickly and more easily than in, in, than in other regions. Thank, thank you, Anka. That, that, that's very clear. Um, and and th th thank you for, for sharing all that research with us. I've, I've shared this two links of the Asian analysis and the global analysis uh, in the box below. And I would encourage um, uh, our audience to, to raise questions or make statements in that chat box, which you have already used to encourage us to go on when we didn't have uh, the right audio uh, signal and you raised already some questions. So please, please um, raise uh, questions if, if you like. And um, I would um, I would like to ask you, Anke, um, whilst uh, our audience is, uh, is considering um, potential questions, um, are there companies um, in in Asia that um, have made sort of uh, sustainable consumption one of their key elements of their strategy? Right. Um, there are a number of examples. They're all very different. I think there are probably many, many examples at also on the on the you know smaller scale, smaller end of the spectrum. Um, but if we think about a couple of maybe better known examples, um, a, a few come to mind for me, um, all very different. Um, one of them is is Allbirds. Um, it's a this is a, a shoe brand from from New Zealand um, that is you know uh, very much focused on on conveying that sustainability message around the way that they what types of materials they use, um, about the the supply chain you know the production and the supply chain of their of their products. Um, so that's 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 um, and it's doing very well in Asia. Um, that's that's one um, one good example. Um, another interesting example is maybe Banyan Tree. Um, this is in the hospitality sector, um, um, a high end. Um, um, hotel um, chain. Um, they've also kind of written on their flags a kind of sustainable um, tourism experience. Um, um, what else? Um, then um, we have one interesting example. I think that's um, that's sort of emerging is is around sustainability messaging overall. Um, when we look at companies, for example, like um, JD, um, they have done a lot of messaging around sustainability recently, and um, JD Logistics, which is um, a subsidiary of, of JD, they have, I think, last end of last year, they have committed to um, they have committed to um, a, a scheme, basically participating in a scheme where they um, lay open um, their methodology around carbon emissions and, and carbon targets and keeping in line with um, um, you know with with uh, with the targets that that we need in order to um, um, to help with climate change so this is one area and they've made some very strong statements there they're one of the very few Chinese companies who have really gone out and and, and made those kind of targets um, in terms of emissions this is obviously not happening in a vacuum. Um, you know, JD is is uh, a very large online platform. Um, they have a very high carbon footprint through their delivery uh, logistics services, um, the delivery of the products that they bought on the platform, and so um, th they obviously see this as as one of the core um, uh, aspects of their strategy to ensure um, that they are becoming very publicly vocal on the issue of carbon. And I think um, with examples like that, other companies are going to follow suit. Um, so I, I'm sure we will see more of that. You know, Some of the larger Chinese companies or Asian companies uh, taking, taking a stand on this. Yeah. Um, 
we we've already talked about the the quite different attitudes across asia and and we we understand the the cultural economic backgrounds uh, of those differences uh, to some extent at least uh, alex is now asking how has covid-19 impacted sustainability perceptions and consumption in the region yeah, it's a it's it's a great it's a great question. Um, I don't have any scientific answer to it. Um, I'm I'm not sure if there's been a, a large scale study that has looked at it. Um, it, it. It may not have impacted it at all in a significant way in the sense of um, you know immediate consumption behavioral changes. I do think that, um, and this is not only true for Asia, but I think across the world, um, the, this crisis has really kicked off a change in thinking. Right on a personal level, but also on a global level, how how we are connected, um, what it means to be a part of of you know of a globally connected world, um, and obviously you know global supply chains and the implications of global supply chains isn't far removed from that kind of thinking, and um, so I think on that level, um, on that personal level, um, the ideas around um, what does it mean. <clears throat> to remain sustainable, what does it mean for our world to 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 remain um, intact? Have become um, a kind of sort of bubble to the surface a lot more than they have before. Um, at the same time, obviously we have an opposing force, and we have you know we have um, economic, in some parts, massive economic challenges on a personal level in terms of income reductions and job losses, and obviously you know. Um, this uh, changes consumption behavior again in many in many ways, and this is also true for for China. Um, a lot of the um, sustainable brands are still in a fairly high highly priced segment segment, um, and so when we're thinking about um, negative impact on income and therefore the ability to spend, then we would expect that we're also seeing um, consumers making choices to cut down on the higher, you know, how higher priced items um, in, you know, and turning to lower priced items that may not have um, such a good uh, sustainability performance as, 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 as the ones that they were maybe buying before. So I can, you know, it's kind of a, I think, um, going in both ways. On the one hand, I think on a personal level, a lot more awareness and a lot more thinking around the issue, but on a practical personal level, um, especially people who are um, negatively impacted financially, we may not see that thinking expressed um, in, in terms of actual, you know, behavioral changes in consumption. But it may in the long term. Um, I'm hopeful it will. Um, Pike is asking another question, Anke, and it's about uh, mm -hmm. do you have any insights on sustainability perceptions and consumption depending on age? Uh, for example, are, are the older age group not as involved as the younger ones? Mm -hmm. um, we don't have it for this study, so we haven't broken the study down by um, <clears throat> by age groups. I know that that there are some studies who do that. Um, I remember, and I, I think I, I shared this um, um, I shared the statistic earlier in this in this uh, slide. I didn't talk about it. Um, in 2017, uh, JD did a study on their online sales, and they're kind of um, you know. <clears throat> They start. They tried to segment um, sustainable products or green products. You know, they had a couple of different labels, and they tried to group them together and then see how are those sales going as compared to um, the more general or the average product. Um, and they were trying to get a sense of how big that market is and who's driving that market. And they had break, they had breakdowns. This is just for China, obviously. They had breakdowns by by age that were quite interesting and that that showed that obviously the younger the younger age segments um, were the largest share overall, but there's a very strong um, 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 positive purchasing behavior also in the older age groups. And I think that is more around um, quality purchasing. Um, obviously, there's also some, I think, some, um, um, we also need to think about transfer income here, especially in China, you know, so, so some of these purchases may indirectly be financed by the younger generation, obviously, you know, so purchases that are done by the older generation being actually financed and influenced by the younger generation. Um, but there was actually, I was surprised, and I can dig that up for you, Pike, I can uh, I can send you that link. I was surprised um, how strong that older age segment was in terms of um, the share of, of purchases. It would be interesting to see if that's true in other um, Asian markets as well. I, 
uh, don't recall seeing a study on it, but um, I will look. Thank, thank you, Anka. Anka, I would like to really thank you for uh, for sharing these uh, results with us. What I would like to point out to our audience is that if you want to engage more on these things, we have two councils, and the next meetings are uh, in November, the Asia Sustainability Leaders Council and the China Sustainability uh, Council. Uh, and um, we have uh, very prominent companies uh, participating in there, and the peer exchange is very encouraging. So I can only uh, um, recommend that to you. If you want to hear more what business leaders think about sustainability and how they implement that into their business, we have a new podcast series. It's called Let's Talk Sustainable Business. Uh, you find it uh, on on uh, all major um, uh, podcast platforms and also on our website. Uh, then uh, we have a, a webcast series. It's called Sustainability Watch. It's every Thursday, uh, uh, every third Thursday, I should say. Uh, unfortunately, for Asia, it's very late, but you can, of course, listen to the recording if, if, if you're interested, and there are some very interesting ones already. And before we finish, I would like to ask you uh, to give us feedback um, on, on this webcast, and uh, I, I would like to thank you for your patience with our technical difficulties we had this time, and I uh, hope uh, we will do uh, better on the technical issues the next time around. So please, please give us feedback because it helps us uh, to improve our service to you. And with that, I thank you for, uh, for listening and hope to uh, have you as a guest uh, audience soon again. Bye-bye.